welcome Dr. Silas Rao and introduce yourself and the topic. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jamin. I am Silas Rao. I've been working on climate change for the last 13 years. I gave a series of webinars last year on how not to go extinct, and I wanted to update them. So I'm going to do this over the next seven sessions because things have changed so much. I'm just looking back at what happened over the last year. I'm just amazed at how fast things are changing. The title of the webinar has changed a bit. So previously it was how not to go extinct. Now I'm calling it healing the planet or how not to go extinct. Okay, so that's the goal. So healing the planet gives it a positive spin on what it is that we are doing. I mean, it's healing the planet requires us to heal ourselves, heal our relationship with nature, heal our relationship with the animals, essentially reverse what we are doing. So I'm going to be talking about transformation instead of change. Change is inevitable, but transformation is intentional. This is what Tracy Martin said. Change is going to happen to us, whether we like it or not. But transformation is something that we choose to do because we anticipate that we have to change anyway. And I'm going to be talking about exponential transformations. Professor Albert Bartlett at the University of Colorado said the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. So we tend to think that whatever is happening to us will continue to happen forever. And then we get really amazed when things have transformed. Most major historical events were exponential transformations. And this is what we remember. We don't remember the period between those transformations. I see exponential transformations as normal in the course of history. So the way I'm going to organize this, I'm going to be talking about background and context first, and then I'll give you examples of exponential transformations just over the last hundred years that we have gone through, and we see what happened at the other end of it. And then we'll talk about how to transform our stories and how to transform our game. Because it's through stories and games that we coordinate actions among ourselves. So this is how billions of human beings can do something cohesive together through stories and games. So the background and context. I'm going to give you an example from my life. This is a fire that happened in my home okay, in 1993. And you'll see that the middle garage is the source of the fire. And the middle garage is where I had a brand new car. I parked a brand new car the previous evening. The next morning, the car caught fire and created a conflagration in my home. So of course, we ran out of the house. And then I called the dealer up and I said, what the hell did he sell me? And he said, oh my God, it happened to you. And so he gave me a number to call an engineer. And he asked me to talk to this engineer. So I called up the engineer and the engineer said, yeah, you know, we tried to fit a V8 engine inside a V6 compartment. And in the process, we routed the fuel line very close to the windshield washer heater. If the fuel line leaks, then the fuel vapors accumulate around the heater. And as the ambient temperature goes up, which happens in the morning, it ignites. So yours is the eighth car that caught fire. And headquarters is waiting for 10 cars to catch fire before they issue a recall. So we actually fixed the problem in May of 1993 by putting a sleeve around the fuel line, which costs 50 cents. But headquarters is waiting to see whether they really should do, do a recall for all cars manufactured before May of 1993. The reason I'm telling you this is not because of what happened. I mean, engineering is not an exact science and you will have bugs and you will have to figure out how to fix them and how to work around these issues because we have, nothing is going to be perfect. I understand that as an engineer. But I'm telling you this because of what happened next. The car company sent a team of experts to examine my fire. The expert team was headed by a professor of physics from the University of Pennsylvania. So here is this well-respected professor of physics from Ivy League University. And I noticed that he was looking at everything except the car. He was not looking at the car. So I asked him, why are you looking at all these other things? when I already spoke to Eric and he told me that the car caught fire. And he said, oh my God, who gave you Eric's number? So then he went and complained to his team. He said, how can I do my job if this guy is calling Eric behind my back? He knows everything. What was his job? His job was to come up with an alternate explanation for the fire that does not involve the car. So even though everyone in the back knew that the car had this problem, they were working on how to fix it but publicly they were pretending 
that this wasn't the problem. There is some other issue happening here. And that's exactly what we are doing to the planet. I mean, this is crazy, right? But that's exactly what we are doing to our problems on the planet. So our Earth is on fire. And the Earth is on fire because we are setting fires. So these are the fires that we set between May 1st and May 10th in 2019. This is a NASA satellite picture of the fires that were set. And why do we set these fires? We set these fires to burn down all vegetation that our cows do not eat. So if our grazing animals don't eat this vegetation, we slash it and then we burn it. So that the only thing that is allowed to grow is what our cows and goats and sheep can eat. So this is grazing land and management of grazing land. And this is how, why we are setting fires. Yet, we don't want to talk about the reason why we are setting these fires, which is our consumption of animals, our treatment of nature, our treatment of animals. I mean, that is at the core of our environmental problems. Yet, we don't want to talk about it. Okay? The UN identified three major issues in 1992. The first, the loss of biological diversity. So they formed a convention on biological diversity, and its purpose was to conserve biological diversity on the planet and to ensure the sustainable use of its genetic resources. This convention was meeting once a year, and then it stopped meeting once a year and started meeting once every two years. Now, did they start meeting once every two years because they've solved the problem? No. I mean, every one of the goals that this convention came up with has not been met. None of them have been met. They were supposed to halt biological diversity loss by 2010. Nothing happened. And why are they pretending? Because the leading cause of this is our consumption of animals. And they don't want to talk about it. Okay? It's just like the professor at my fire. The second is the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. And its purpose was to reverse and prevent desertification and land degradation. And even this convention is now meeting once every two years. Not because desertification has been halted. In fact, desertification is happening at the fastest rate ever. It's because the leading reason for this is what we are doing to animals, and they don't want to talk about it. So the only thing we keep talking about is climate change now. Because climate change is being framed as a problem that's caused just by fossil fuels. Okay? And by framing it that way, we can focus on that, so we can focus on something other than the car that caught fire. So like the professor was focusing on the heater in my garage, he said the heater caught fire first, and then he threw flames at the car and made the car catch fire. That was his explanation for why my house fire was happening. This is similar to that. We are lying to ourselves. We are pretending that the leading cause of climate change is not animal agriculture, but it is just fossil fuels. But if you look closely, you will see that that's not true. And why are we doing it this way? President George H.W. Bush went to the Rio Convention and he said, the American way of life is non-negotiable. The way it was interpreted is that the pursuit of consumption, you know, consumerism and the pursuit of pleasure is non-negotiable. That's the way it was interpreted. But he also said, think of every challenge we face. And the solution to every challenge is education. And he's absolutely right about that. You know? So when we educate ourselves, when we really understand what is the root cause of all of our problems, we will do the right thing. In fact, I am all for the American way of life. I love the American way of life. The specifications are amazing. The specifications are amazing, but the implementation is the exact opposite of the specifications. And that's our problem. All men are created equal. Well, I interpret that to mean all beings are created equal, not just all men, all women, all beings are created equal. And we all have the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I'm all for Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. But if you look at what we are really doing, the implementation, it is the exact opposite. Instead of the inalienable right to life, we have the greatest killing machine in human history. Instead of liberty, we have the most incarcerated population in human history. And instead of the pursuit of happiness, it has become the pursuit of consumerism and the pursuit of pleasure. And we have become the most medicated population in human history. When specification and implementation don't match, it means that we are not facing reality, that we are deluding ourselves. There's a mass delusion at play. 
Richard Feynman said that, you know, and as an engineer, this is my job. My job is to match specification with implementation. This is how I do it. I do it by facing the truth. So Richard Feynman, when he was asked to examine the challenge of disaster, he said, the reason the disaster happened is because we knew something was not going to work, and yet we pretended it's going to work. So for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, but nature cannot be fooled. Because nature is blindly implementing the truth. And why are we doing that? Because of the game of money. For health, we know that 14 of the 15 leading causes of death in Western countries can be mitigated and even reversed with a whole foods vegan diet. And yet our healthcare system does not focus on this. So this is not the focus because diseases make money right now. For the environment, the destruction leads to money. This is why the IPCC does not focus on animal agriculture. And they talk about solutions that bypass animal agriculture. Even though they say that we have to change within the next 10 years. It is the root cause and yet we don't look at it. Just like the professor who didn't want to look at the root cause of the fire. Because there are two main engines of planetary destruction that humanity has created. First is the killing machine, which is spearheaded by animal agriculture. And the second is the burning machine, which is fossil fuels and industry. And we can analyze what each machine is doing and see which is really the leading cause of climate change. So what is the leading cause of climate change? Well, you look at the gases that we have put into the atmosphere since 1750. Carbon dioxide is causing about 1.68 watts per square meter of heating. Aerosols, sulfates and surface albedo are causing negative 1.1 watt per square meter of cooling. So it's actually cooling the atmosphere. And then other gases like methane, nitrous oxide, HFCs are adding another 1.7 watts per square meter of heating. So the total is about 2.3 watts per square meter of heating. And that's causing the climate change, okay? This is the extra heating that we're doing. Now you can then analyze how much each of these machines are causing. The annual emissions of the burning machine. It's 87% of the CO2. And we are adding 39 gigatons of CO2 per year. 7.8 gigatons is one part per million, okay? And if you want to calculate the radiative forcing cost, by this, it's proportional to the logarithm of the concentration in the atmosphere. So we are adding over five parts per million. The base there was 390 parts per million. So anyway, you calculate this function, you will see that this is causing about 0.027 watts per square meter of heating every year. Okay, The CO2 from the burning machine. It's also causing 23% of the methane. And the methane is proportional to the square root of the concentration in the atmosphere. So this is the function that we have to use to calculate the impact of methane. And the methane is causing about 0.02 watts per square meter of heating per year. Now, the burning machine is also responsible for 100% of the SO2, the sulfur dioxide. Almost the entire sulfur dioxide is caused by burning coal and oil. And that is causing negative 0.95 watts per square meter of cooling. So overall, when you add this up, the burning machine every year is causing about negative 0.9 watts of cooling. Cooling, it's not heating, it's cooling. So this is why Jamin is right about solar radiation management. We need to compensate for this before we shut down the burning machine. We need to put reflectors in place to provide us with 0.9 watts per square meter of cooling before we shut down the burning machine. So this is what Jim Hansen called the Faustian bargain on fossil fuels. What he means by that is that we are adding these permanent greenhouse gases like CO2 in the atmosphere. At the same time, it's giving us this cooling. So we are stuck with adding more and more. We're burning more and more fossil fuels until we sort out this problem. Okay? Now look at the killing machine. Killing machine is responsible for 31% of the CO2, which is a 0.09 watts per square meter of heating. It's responsible for 37% of the methane, which is 0.035 watts per square meter of heating. And it's using up 37% of the land area of the planet just to graze the animals. And on that land, we are constantly burning the vegetation to prevent anything new from growing. Okay? The opportunity cost of that is 34.5 gigatons of CO2, which is from a paper by Searchinger in Nature from last year. 
And so that causes an additional 0.06 watts per square meter of opportunity cost heating. If you shut down the killing machine today, we will start cooling the earth by 0.1 watt per square meter per year. Per year. So within 20 years, we can bring it down, you know, close to zero, right? So this is why I say shutting down the killing machine is the number one thing we should be doing. Shutting down the animal agriculture industry is the number one thing we should be doing. And this is like putting the sleeve on the fuel line in the car. It's simple. For us as a species, it's about eating this versus eating that, or wearing this versus wearing that. And for the animals and the planet, it's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of extinction or no extinction. And we can see how we can reverse climate change by looking at the land use and how much carbon is stored on land. So 12% of the land is currently being used for raising crops. Half of the cropland output is going to feed our animals. Another quarter is going to fuels. So only one quarter of the cropland output human beings are eating directly. Okay? And then we use 37% of the land area of the planet just to graze the animals. And because we keep burning the vegetation that grows on that land, and we keep depleting the soil by doing that, it only stores 2% of the land carbon. Now, on land, we are storing three times as much carbon as in the atmosphere. Therefore, if you want to reverse what's happened to the atmosphere, we have increased the atmospheric carbon by 30%, over the last 200 years, we have to increase the carbon on land by 10%. So on this 37% of the land, if we raise this from 2% to 20%, we can literally reverse climate change. So it's fairly easy to do. I mean, we can do it. We are human beings. There are 7.8 billion of us. And if we put our minds to it, we can easily accomplish this within the next 20 years. So next, animals. As far as the animals are concerned, Again, it's the money game that we are playing makes us destroy the planet and their life. So if you look at the wild animal population, the total weight of wild animals 10,000 years ago was 200 million tons. By 1970, we had wiped out 60% of them, down to 80 million tons. And our population was about 3 billion human beings in 1970. And so our weight was equal to the weight of all the wild animals that lived 10,000 years ago. And on top of that, we were raising farmed animals that were double our weight, and they were eating three times as much food as we eat. Then fast forward another 40 years, by 2010, wild animal population had down by another 52%, so which means they're down 80% from what they were 10,000 years ago. Our population doubled, and on top of that, we were raising farmed animals eating four and a half times as much food as we eat. So overall, their weight was equal to nine times the weight of all the wild animals that lived 10,000 years ago. Now, even from this, you can see what we are doing to animals is the root cause of what's happening to us. If we stop treating animals as objects and start treating them as they also have an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we can solve this problem. And finally, for love, you know, I mean, I think it is time for us to recognize that we are part of something much, much bigger than just individual human beings. And because of that, we are going to be asked to transform ourselves. And this is happening through exponential transformations. It's already happening. Okay. I'll show you how it happens. And if you look at human history, all the major significant events have happened through exponential transformations. In 1914, if you look at Gandhi's photograph from India, he was wearing a suit and a tie, you know, he was a lawyer. And by 1920, you can see that he has changed his clothes because he started the Khadi movement in 1919, exactly 100 years ago. And the Khadi movement, he convinced the people of India to change their clothes from British clothes to Khadi clothes made by Indians in India. And his idea then was to strike at the number one industry in England at that time, which was the textile industry. This is how he was going to free India from colonial rule. So he wrote in 1926 in the Navjivan magazine, I consider it my duty to induce people by every honest means to wear khadi. So this was not a passive man saying, you know, here, look at me wearing khadi. It's okay, no matter what you wear, I'll be okay with you. No, no, he was convincing people to change their clothes from British clothes to khadi clothes made by Indians in India. And by doing that, he united the people of India in a common cause. Because they all saw each other wearing khadi, said, yeah, we are all part of the same movement and we are trying to get the British out of India. 
And by 1930, you can see everyone was wearing khadi. And the British government was on its knees begging to negotiate with Gandhi. And this is why they imposed the salt tax, which is what this march was about. Doing this started the negotiations that led to Indian independence in 17 years. So this was an exponential change that happened in India. Over 180 million people were wearing khadi in 10 years. Okay. Same thing happened in the US in 1962 when President Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon you know, at Rice University in 1962. People laughed at him. I said, what? You know, we don't even have technology to send people up to space and bring them back safely. You're talking about sending people to the moon? But it inspired the people of America. And scientists got together. They broke down the problem into pieces. And then they addressed each piece, solved it. And man was on the moon in 1969, in seven years. This was an exponential transformation that occurred you know, in technology. Same thing happened with the internet. In 1995, I remember this article in Newsweek saying the internet is going nowhere. Who's going to read things on the internet? Who's going to buy stuff off the internet? It's going nowhere. Okay? And in fact, he was complaining about too many connections. Try again later. All these hourglasses that show up and you're just looking for the Battle of Trafalgar. Okay? And so I was working on that. I was trying to make the connections much more robust. And within eight years, I overheard someone say, I cannot live without the internet because we made the backbone much more robust. We made it run 10 times faster. And Google guys were there, and they were able to show when the Battle of Trafalgar was happening. The internet is what it is now because of this exponential transformation that happened. The vegan movement is the same thing is happening now. You know, in 2015, when I presented this paper showing how if the world goes vegan, we can literally reverse climate change. People came to me and they said, yeah, you're right, but it'll never happen. I said, aha, I've heard this before several times. And then I started observing the exponential transformation that's happening, okay? Because in 2016, the search for the term vegan exceeded the search for the term Coca-Cola for the first time ever. And it was happening in all the rich countries of the world. The vegan movement was exploding. This is why fast food companies are now offering vegan meat options because they have no choice. Just like the British had no choice but to stand by and watch us all change our clothes, fast food companies have no choice but to give us what we are demanding, which is vegan food. Either they do that or they're going to go bankrupt. And Forbes reported that the number of vegans in the US increased by a factor of seven, 600% increase, 7x growth between 2014 and 2017. So at that rate, if we can maintain that rate of growth, by 2020, it will be another factor of seven, by 2023, a factor of 49, and by 2026, a factor of 343. That's how exponential growth blows up. And if that happens, the US will be completely vegan by 2026. And we will have a vegan world by 2026. This is why I say, just like Gandhi, I consider it my duty to induce people by every honest means to go vegan. Okay? Because it's just like the Kadi movement, this movement is the Kadi movement of the 21st century. But to do that, we need to transform our stories and to transform our game. So the story we have to tell is to focus on David versus the marble shards. Imagine that Michelangelo, after carving David, you find him trying to kill himself. And he said, why are you trying to kill yourself? And he says, how am I going to clean up the mess I've made with the pieces of marble on the floor using a hammer and a chisel? So I might as well kill myself with a hammer and chisel. That's exactly what we are doing as a species. We are focusing on the mess we have made. We are ignoring the David we have created. And we are trying to clean up the mess using the exact same tools we used to make that mess and to create that David. Okay. This is just like the elephant. You know, if you look at an elephant in the forest and the elephant is breaking branches of trees, you may think the elephant is being really destructive. But wherever the elephant broke branches of trees, that's where the sunlight streams and nourishes the underbrush. So everything the elephant does has a benefit to nature. Similarly, we are just like the elephant. We are a species just like any other species, and we are part of nature, whether we like it or not. We have been part of nature, and we'll always remain part of nature. We have been the climate regulators of planet Earth. We have had this role, and we didn't even know it. So that's the hypothesis, the climate healers hypothesis. Okay? 
And we can see that from the early Anthropocene hypothesis Bill Rudderman wrote in his book, Plows, Plagues, and Petroleum. Because for the last three million years, the Earth has gone through over 100 ice ages in an interglacial period. And the difference in temperature between an ice age and the interglacial period is about 10 degrees Celsius. Okay? So it's huge. What happened is during this time, we were spawned as a species. And in the current interglacial period, we did something amazing. The Earth was going to go back to another ice age in the current interglacial period, just like it did three interglacial periods ago, except through our activities, we prevented it from happening. We prevented it from happening. It was actually following the same trend as three interglacial periods ago. And then you see the human effect of what we did. We burned down forests, we pumped up CO2 into the atmosphere, we cultivated rice and animal agriculture and increased the methane in the atmosphere. So this kept the temperature constant for the last 10,000 years, instead of it going down to an ice age 5,000 years ago. We kept the temperature constant. And then over the last 200 years, we discovered fossil fuels. And using that, we have created all the tools and technologies we need to understand what we did and to help us govern ourselves in the new phase. Okay? So just like the elephant stops cutting down the branches of trees after a while, we are now at a position where we have to transform ourselves. If we continue doing what we're doing, this is what Bill Rudiman is projecting, we are going to kill ourselves off and we are going to go back to another ice age eventually. That's his projection. Instead, if we all go vegan and we regenerate the forests that we have destroyed, we can reverse climate change and then all the fossil fuel carbon will still be up in the atmosphere, which will prevent the Earth from going back to another ice age. So we can become the thermostat species of the planet. And to do that, we need to transform our game. Because the game of money that we are playing today is causing the mess that we are creating. It's also causing the David to have been created. So we heated up the earth using this game, and we also created a mess using this game. Okay? The game of money is fundamentally the game that we all play. Every day we wake up and say, how am I going to feed myself? Well, you have to go get some money to feed yourself. So it's about how do I get money for today? Right? And Buckminster Fuller said, if you want to teach people a new way of thinking, don't bother trying to teach them. Instead, give them a tool, a new game, the use of which will lead to new ways of thinking. So that's what I'm going to talk about. How do we transform our game so that we now, when we play the new game, we automatically cool the earth and we automatically regenerate the planet. So the current game you're playing, the next stage of that is this Libra currency where a hundred corporations are each putting $10 million into the Libra Association. So they're collecting a billion dollars to create this Libra currency. And this is going to happen because Facebook is part of big, big media and all the big corporations, big pharma, big meat, big media, big chem, big banks, all of them have the same four financial holding companies as the voting shareholders. And these four financial holding companies are all private companies, so they don't have to disclose their shareholders. So we don't even know who owns the planet, okay? So this is what's going on right now. And because they are all owned by the same four financial holding companies, and Facebook is having a partnership of 100 of these corporations, of course it's going to happen. This is all intended. And this game is literally destroying the planet, the game of money. Because the game of money, new currency is created in the form of loans. So for every $100 that you deposit in a bank, the bank is allowed to loan out $90, can keep only 10% of what your deposits are, and then give out the rest as loans. And then when that $90 comes back into the bank, $81 gets loaned out. So from the original $100, you get $900 worth of loans. This is how new currency is created. And what do you do with loans? Well, you have to return it. To return it, you have to go and do something with that money. You have to go and destroy the planet some more. So we are creating a system, a game, in which we are automatically have to grow and we also automatically have to fight with each other. We have to compete with each other. Okay? That's how the game is played. How do you earn money in the game? Well, you can go beg. I see a whole bunch of people doing that in street corners these days. Or you can go borrow from a bank. Or you can go work, which basically is slavery. So you can see there is a trap there. And the guy goes to get the money. Or you have to be creative enough to come up with new ideas which get funded. 
And very few people can do this. So most of us are stuck in the first three. And this game discourages natural abundance. So for any given demand, the supply is here, you get a certain price, but if the supply increases, which means you have an abundance, the price plummets to zero. And I've seen examples of this happening. I mean, I went to India three years ago where there was a spate of suicides among potato farmers. Potato farmers were killing themselves because they grew too many potatoes. They grew too many potatoes and the price of potatoes plummeted, so they couldn't return the loans that they had borrowed from the bank. And so they were drinking poison and killing themselves off. Because that's the game you're playing. It's a game in which we value scarcity. And when you value scarcity, you're going to get scarcity. This is like going and asking for scarcity from nature, and nature's going to give it to you. That's what you want. It promotes artificial scarcity. Right now, human beings are extracting 9 billion tons of food from the planet. Okay? 9 billion tons of plant food. And we only eat 1.5 billion tons of food total, human beings, put together. So what are we doing with the rest? Well, we feed it to our animals. Animals are eating 7.3 billion tons of food, and they're providing 0.26 billion tons of food, which goes into this processing block, and it comes out as 0.19 billion tons of food. So from 7.2 billion tons of food, you get 0.19 billion tons of food. That's the total weight, almost a 40 to 1 reduction that happens. And the animals also provide 0.14 billion tons of other substances like blood, bones, and skin, and things like that. This is why I say going vegan will address this problem. Just eating plant-based does not do it. When we go vegan, we are particular about what we wear. We are checking whether there are animal products in anything that we buy. So we force corporations to change, to stop using animals for any purpose whatsoever. And when we do that, we are dissolving this whole block, this production block. So this game, we started out with 9 billion tons of food, and it creates just 1.5 billion tons of food at the end of it. And it's a game of creating artificial scarcity because there are about 900 million of us who are going hungry every day. Okay? Even though we are extracting six times as much food as we really need for the same number of calories. The same with calcium and milk. We are told you need to drink milk, otherwise you're not going to have enough calcium in your body. And then you discover that chia seeds are more calcium than milk. In fact, it's factor six. It promotes perverse subsidies. So we keep propping up this industry, even though it is on its deathbed right now. In 2018, this is how much meat and dairy was stored by the US government. They just bought the meat and dairy and they store it in refrigerated warehouses. And after one year, they dump it. You can see the size of this warehouse in relation to the size of the Capitol building. This game promotes death, disease, and destruction. We pour all these toxins out into the environment, over 250 billion tons of toxins into the environment, and it's not regulated. And it's deliberately not regulated in this game because we are making money creating those toxins. And then those toxins get concentrated on the animal foods that we eat. And we persuade people to eat more animal foods as they go up in the economic ladder. So then they get concentrated doses of these toxins in their food. And then they get sick. We give them pharmaceuticals and we take the money back from them. So it's a game of fishing for money. Yeah? When you fish for money, this is what you do. Through diseases and destruction, you're creating money for yourself. It promotes oppression. What is happening to the animals is unthinkable. If you watch the movie Earthlings or Dominion, you'll be horrified as to what is really going on. So oppression, speciesism, colonialism, racism, and patriarchy are built into this system. It's built into the animal agriculture industry. When we go and tell people who are living in the Amazon to get out of there because we're going to clear the Amazon to grow more beef, we're literally telling them that their culture is inferior to our culture and they need to get out of the way of our culture. That's colonialism 101. If you look at who is really working in the slaughterhouses, you will see people of color. So there is racism built in to the animal agriculture industry. You see where they locate these slaughterhouses and factory farms, it's near people of color. There is sexism built in, patriarchy built into the animal agriculture industry, because this is about the exploitation of the feminine. So when we exploit the feminine of the animal, this is why incidences of domestic violence increases among factory farm workers. So patriarchy is built into the system. 
but we transform the game. When we transform the game, we are going to have the greatest transformation in human history. This is the greatest transformation in human history, and we are part of it. We are in the middle of it, right? In fact, we have to accomplish this within the next six years. Isn't that amazing? We have to design this and implement it within the next six years. Instead of going extinct, we are going to transform and thrive in the new game. The new game is going to be about normalized nonviolence as opposed to normalized violence we have today. And we are going to transform from a predator species to a caretaker species. In fact, we call ourselves Homo sapiens today, which shows you the kind of arrogance we have as a species, because sapiens means wise, and no wise person ever goes around saying they're wise. When you go around saying you're wise, you're pretty arrogant. Okay? So that's what we've been doing to the other species. We are the wise species. And so it's about now acquiring some humility and to become Homo Ahimsa. So Homo Ahimsa to me is a blend of a Latin word and a Sanskrit word, which is symbolic of us coming together as a species across the world. Ahimsa is nonviolence. So it describes how we relate to other life as opposed to self-congratulatory sapiens. I say there are seven core shifts that need to happen going from speciesism, colonialism, racism, ableism, and patriarchy, which stands for SCRAP, S-C-R-A-P, SCRAP, to veganism and radical equality. Okay? So it just says scrap it. In this discourse of social justice, people usually ignore speciesism. And I say if you ignore speciesism, it is just C-R-A-P, crap. You have to include speciesism. It is the foundational oppression from diseases and divisions for humanity to health and unity for humanity, from destruction and pollution of the planet to remediation and regeneration of the planet, from death and cruelty to animals to love and kindness for animals, from a culture of consumption to a culture of compassion, from a mindset of scarcity to a mindset of abundance, and from a money-driven economy to a service-driven economy. These are the seven core shifts I'm talking about. And the new game, the game of Aquarius, automatically implements these seven shifts, okay? So in relation to Libra, which automatically implements everything on the left-hand side here, which is about destroying ourselves. In the proposed Aquarius money game, money comes through individuals. It's not a central bank that issues money. All money comes through individuals. And in fact, every individual gets exactly the same flow rate at the input, okay? So this implements equality to begin with, radical equality to begin with. But the money flows into the heart of the account. And there is a certain flow rate from the heart to the pocket. Money in the pocket is what can be used. And each token here is a measure of the ecological footprint of humanity. Through the Aquarius money game, we're actually measuring our ecological footprint and making sure that we don't exceed limits. Because if we don't measure our ecological footprint and make sure that we don't exceed our limits, as an engineer, I'm not comfortable that we will be within our limits. I always want to measure and make sure that we are within limits. Now the flow rate to the pocket can be regulated by acts of compassionate service. So if we do acts of compassionate service, the flow rate increases. And if we don't do acts of compassionate service, let's say we are all sitting around watching TV every day, then the flow stays in the heart, the heart fills up, and then there's more and more flow going into the community chest. So there is a certain flow rate into the community chest, which increases as the heart fills up. The idea is that people who are idle are the ones who are providing more and more taxes. Okay? Each community then has the same architecture for the Aquarius currency. How do you earn money in this currency, in this game? Through doing service to other human beings, doing service to the earth, doing service to animals, and by being creative. It's the same four possibilities. So this encourages us to become proactive, to do things like cleaning up the plastic that's out there. That increases the flow into your account. And this has to be based on an open source economy and ecology. There is no such thing as it's my idea and I'm going to make money off of this idea. No, every idea is built on other people's ideas. <laughs> so there is no such thing as my idea. It's an idea that came that has to be donated to the whole. So it's all for the good of the whole. So it's an open source economy and ecology. It aligns with our true nature because we all are compassionate to begin with. So this is why in the game, acts of compassion get you rewards. It raises our consciousness. 
it makes us feel like we are part of nature and we are doing something for the good of the whole. Okay? So this is why I say vegan stands for vitally engaged guardians of animals and nature. That's what we will all become. And we can transition to this game while we are playing the original money game. We are working on this app, the Aquarius. In fact, it's part of another app that we're working on. The idea then is that as we play the Aquarius game in conjunction with the money game, slowly whatever we are doing in the money game will transform as well. This is like buying vegan food forces fast food companies to start offering vegan food. So when we buy ecologically sound products, it will force corporations to behave that way. So it creates a transition path from the old game to the new game. And it implements everything we need on the right-hand side of the core ships. And I say, instead of 101 corporations putting $10 million each, this game should be funded by individuals putting exactly $101 each. But we must choose to play this game. This game cannot be played by force. We cannot force people to play the game. We must choose to transform ourselves. The ends don't justify the means. Just because we want to get to a planet that's thriving, we cannot force people to play games but we can persuade them. So I use the analogy of Henry Fonda in 12 Angry Men. We should all be like Henry Fonda in 12 Angry Men, inviting people to join your side. Eventually, everyone will come along. Even Lee Cobb went along at the end. We must choose to transform to a caretaker species. So thank you very much. That's my presentation. And my books are available online for free. You can read them for free. And you can check all the facts at climatelist.org slash facts. There are all the references are there. And you can email me anytime as well. Beautiful, Shailish. We're all applauding. Thank you. And very grateful. Very grateful. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm, I'm so inspired that we have a leader, you, who is so committed and is changing so many of our lives. As I look around the faces here today, in this video conference room, I see so many people whose lives are touched by you on a daily basis. You've brought so many of us together. You know, Silas, just before you joined, we were talking about the coronavirus and how that's mm -hmm. temporarily or otherwise shutting down industry, which in turn is reducing right. global dimming, which is therefore increasing the heat load. And we talked about all the urgency, the extreme urgency that that represents. The solutions that you're putting on the table are so urgent, along with SRM. There's a small number of solutions that are just super urgent. And so we were talking about what if we were to just focus on that? And to get these solutions implemented is going to require the input and cooperation of all of us. Chime in with any questions or comments specifically for Dr. Rao. Emery has his hand up. Go ahead, Emery. I think as we proceed in expanding our knowledge, we're going to have to be patient. We're going to have to be repeating ourselves many, many, many times. Because as new people come, we're going to have to reiterate the details that are required for people to get the understanding necessary to move ahead. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You know, it requires patience. This is why I mentioned Henry Fonda's character in 12 Angry Men. It's a good example of how to bring people to your side. Everything he does is something that we should be emulating as a group. Being welcoming of people, getting the next segment of population to come along and join us with the SRM and collective intelligence and the veganism, because this is the core, the three pillars of the new system. We have to do solar radiation management for the rest of creation. I mean, we are stuck with it because we are the ones who have the capacity to alter the climate of the planet. We know that now. So it's not a short-term thing. I mean, it's a long-term commitment we are taking on as a species to maintain the climate of the planet. All righty. Ray has his hand up. Welcome, Ray, and take it away. Silesh, so, many Americans feel that the Green New Deal is our best hope. How does it fare when evaluated against your seven core shifts? Uh, it scores zero out of seven. By ignoring speciesism as a core oppression, the Green New Deal does not really address the problem. So it's a little bit like the professor looking at everything except the car. It's not like the scientists don't know that our relationship with nature is the core problem. They all know that. We are pretending not to know. 
as long as we keep pretending that something is true and it isn't, we will never do the right thing. I don't believe you mentioned your white paper. Can you talk about that for a little bit? I used the data from the white paper showing you the impact of the killing machine and the burning machine. So that data is taken from the white paper, but basically it's straight from published literature. The white paper to me was something that Jane Wellers Mitchell asked me to write, and that became a turning point. It forced me to put my thoughts down in one place about this. Why am I doing what I'm doing? <laughs> that was her question. She said, why do you do what you do? Explain to us why you do that. And so I decided to write it down, and that helped a lot in focusing my thoughts. I mean, I'd written it about it in my books, but it wasn't all put together in one place like the white paper was. So this is why when I look back and see how much has changed since October of last year, it's huge. I feel like I'm in a different era altogether. Yeah, somebody mentioned just a moment ago that we have to repeat ourselves. We have to repeat this message again and again. And you've done this presentation a few times, but it keeps evolving. I'm hearing nuances to it. This is a growing idea and people are going to get involved with it. And your white paper is being shared around quite a bit. Yeah, former fruit is being considered for publication in the Ecological Society Journal, but they are hesitating to publish it because they say that it's already published on your website, so why should we publish it? <laughs> That's the response I got back. And yet a lot of people who have, who have uh, been, you know, had the white paper in their hands, they read the first line and they go, well, is this peer reviewed? Has this been published anywhere? So it's become a catch 22. Right. Are they going through a peer review process? Have they evaluated the, the content? Yeah, they're, go they're going through a peer review process. They want to call it a review paper. So this way they can still publish it, going through the peer review process for that. And I guess it qualifies as a review paper because you're bringing together a lot of already published work. You're not right. introducing anything new other than hey, look, when you put these blocks together, you get this solution revealing this huge blind spot that the science community, especially the climate change community, has been ignoring. It's not a blind spot. I think they all know. The equivalent of me calling that engineer and asking him about why my car caught fire is, the, is me calling Atul Jain and asking him how much carbon is sequestered on grassland. That is the crux of the problem, right? When you realize that only 2% of the carbon is stored on 37% of the land, and on that land, if you bring back the original forest, it would sequester 20% of the carbon on land. That already tells you that there's a solution there. This is the equivalent of putting a sleeve you know, on that fuel line. It's a simple one, right? People are upset that I called this guy and got the numbers for myself because that number is not published in IPCC papers at all. IPCC does not tell you that grassland is only storing 2% of the carbon. They don't tell you that. Grazing lands are so poor at storing carbon. They don't tell you that because they know that you, once you see that, you will put two and two together and figure out that there is a solution. It's a logical thing, right? Just like I happened to get hold of that engineer and talk to him about my car, I happened to get hold of Atul. I mean, in fact, I tried to get hold of Atul <laughs> because I wrote to every member of the land carbon committee in the IPCC. Atul is the only one who responded to me. Beautiful. Really great conversation. We've got a couple of folks with their hands up. Uh, we've got Jim, followed by Emery. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you, Dr. Rouse, for the brilliant presentation. To me, it seems like a holistic approach. Without solar radiation management, without initial cooling of the planet, we're losing habitat. Right. You know, I think growing any plants require good soil, good habitat, and if we're in a drought, that 30% of the land used for animal agriculture, we lose habitat, we lose part of that 30%. What you're describing is a long-term solution for a healthy organism that can be restored. Given that we have so much 416 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere right now, and looking at the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum of 65 million years ago, you know, we're not dealing with a healthy planet right now. We're dealing with a very unhealthy organism. And I think the biggest question we all have is how much time do we have? You know, do we have the 20 years that you're proposing for this solution to work? So I think. The only hope is for solar radiation management, and that's a desperate Hail Mary pass right now. But I do believe that it's a healthy 
lifestyle that you're proposing. So I give you so much credit for all your work that you've done. And thank, I think humanity owes you a debt of gratitude. So thank you very much. Thank you. I've seen forests being regenerated very quickly on land that had absolutely nothing on it. So people were able to harness the water that's falling and using that to regenerate the soil, regenerate the forest. I've seen examples of this. I think nature has this tendency to heal. Just like our body, when we start doing the right thing to our body, the body heals very quickly. So the time to do it is now. You know, The time to change, transform is now. And as we transform, we need to help Mother Nature heal herself. So there will be things that we need to intervene and do. The forest didn't come back on its own. People actually went and helped the forest come back. We are part of Mother Nature's organism. We are the healing mechanism for Mother Nature too. So we need to bring ourselves to actually do our job for the good of the whole. And when we do that, I think we can reverse this. And once we reverse this, our children are going to thank us. Our grandchildren are going to thank us for going through this process and making sure that there'll be no more ice ages forever and ever. I mean, that is a great story, right? So I say the story that we are telling, the story of transformation, the story of David, it's an amazing story, which says that we have been part of nature all along. I think stories are very important for the transformation. This story is very important for the transformation because it helps people overcome the trauma that we have gone through and heal ourselves and heal the planet in the process. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that we don't know what can happen at 2 and 3C. Right, right. We don't want to get there, right? So we need to figure out how to reverse that as quickly as possible. Great discussion, everyone. Thank you. Good stuff. All righty. James. Good talk there. And uh, thanks very much for uh, to Silish there as well. So no one idea is enough. Mm -hmm. But priorities have to be taken place. Now, while the priority is being worked on, all the other ideas will be worked on as well. And as I stressed earlier, SRM is the priority. This is common sense, obviously. Like, you know, my mother had a very old saying, she used to always say to me regarding my eating habit, everything in moderation. So we need everything in moderation, but we need it implemented, obviously. So everybody in the fields, I think they're all right. Everybody with ideas, they're all right. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. That's all I want to say. Thank you very I much. I understand. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. With respect to moderation, though, I do want to emphasize that just like we don't accept colonialism in moderation or patriarchy in moderation or racism in moderation, we should not accept speciesism in moderation. So we need to put our foot down now, you know, because this is enough, enough of this. We have viruses now running amok because of what we're doing to animals. We're destroying the planet because of what we're doing to animals. So it's time for us to say that is a social justice issue. It is the foundation of all oppressions. And unless we deal with that seriously, uh, we're not dealing with any of the other social justice issues seriously. That's the one caution I have with moderation. Thank you.